me when I played University of Hawaii. Wow. Over there is a, there's one of me versus Kobe Bryant. And yeah, no, it turned out, uh, it turned out very nice. I'm happy. I'm happy with it. Wow. Hello, bonjour, this is All The Talk today, a new episode, I'm very, very excited, I'm going to get to talk uh, to a, one of the greatest basketball players in, uh, in Canada, and uh, for sure, the best player in Newfoundland, Canada. I have the pleasure to welcome in the show today, Carl uh, English. Welcome, Carl. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, I'm so thrilled to have you and uh, being able to share some of your stories, I... Uh, I had one of my swimmer who is a proud Newfoundlander and uh, once I started that show, he was so excited to tell me that he could try and get a connection with you and he loves basketball so much and he loves you so much. So that's, uh, that show, it's, uh, dedicated, it's going to be dedicated for him. This is uh, my man Owen, Owen Daly. So that, that's okay. his show today. So wow. uh, Carl, I went through uh, your book. Wow. I have to tell you that, uh, that it took me like, uh, oh, I lost you. So I was saying that uh, I, I discovered your story by reading your book. And, uh, and I have to be honest that I know Canadian basketball, but we all know Canadian basketball through uh, Steve Nash. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I had to uh, watch some game and video on YouTube and figure out that at some point, yeah, I saw that guy. And yeah. to me, you were the cocky guy in the Canadian team. But uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that after. But I was talking about your book. And uh, I had to say that after the, sh the first chapter, I took two days off. I could not, yeah. <laughs> I could not, could not move on. Uh, we, all our, we all have our story. Uh, your story is uh, a story with, you know, we don't choose where, how we start our life. We don't choose where we are born. We don't choose our situation and we usually try to take the best out of it and i think you are you are i think you are an example of that so let's start about you and like but i forgot to introduce you but i mean you play for the canadian team for many years you yes. uh, were drafted in 2003 the probably one of the worst or the hardest draft ever in the nba history the one with lebron uh, um, Carmelo Anthony. Uh, it was it was a huge, huge, huge 2003 draft. Yes, you played in the D League for two years, then yes. move overseas, play in Italy, play in Spain, play in Croatia. I want to talk about Croatia because I know I know European basketball too, and it's pretty okay. wild there. Um, yeah. And you play in Puerto Rico, went back in. Spain, Spain, did I, and you end up in Germany. Germany and Greece, played in Greece. You played in Greece too. You played in Greece yeah, too. Athens yeah. and then played, finished off my career here in Newfoundland. And most of your career was, the greatest time was in Spain. Yeah, about 10 years in Spain. That Spain is your, your best league outside the NBA. So um, once I got there and had success and my family, two of my kids were born in Spain actually. So we felt comfortable there and, and we stayed there as long as, as long as I wanted. So today, you obviously you are at the end of your career. You are enjoying uh, you are uh, enjoying uh, the retirement moment, maybe, but we are still busy. You just yes. share with me uh, your new uh, your new uh, project. You want to talk a little bit about that before we got into? I more open up. Your... Uh, I open up a full gym there, uh, pure basketball court. So we retrofitted the building and changed a few things there. Uh, and started a, a multi-sport, or not multi-sport, multi, oh, boys and girls from basically K, K to 12, boys and girls. And then we have some elite under 14, 16, and 18 teams. Um, we'll run a bunch of different uh, school programs and things out of here for basketball. And this week has been the first week, so it's been, uh, it's been extremely busy, but it's also been fun as well. So it's, it's an exciting, exciting project. Like, uh, yeah. how many... Like, how big is basketball in St. John? Basketball is big. Hockey is our biggest sport. But a lot of kids, there's probably more kids playing basketball because it's not as expensive as hockey. So um, it's, it's starting to grow. It's starting to grow a lot since we brought the edge here in 2017 or 18. 
um, it, it, a lot of people fell back in love with basketball and it's kind of grown to new heights. So we have, I'd say definitely a couple hundred kids in our programs and stuff. And it, yeah, we got a couple hundred kids, I would say at least in our program and uh, things are going well. The first week has been, it's been challenging just trying to navigate through all these COVID restrictions and, and protocol. But other than that, it's, uh, it's off the ground and off the ground running. So you are planning on keep building that academy and keep working with developing new kids that try to be, yes. bring them to good university and good program after that? That's the plan. Uh, I'd like to take these young programs and get them exposure. First of all, I left when I was uh, 16, going on 17, to, to just try to get a college scholarship. So I think there's many ways I can help them with that and the people I know and the connections I have. But just getting them off the island to, to get recruited is, a, is half the battle. It's, a, it's a, the biggest challenge. So let's, back to, let's go back to your, uh, to your story. And, uh, and to me, like reading your book, I mean, if you guys want to have, uh, want to read a book about uh, someone who never give up, someone who, <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> who put the knee on the ground once and get up another time and put the knee on another, another, another time <laughs> once on the ground and get up. I mean, this is, this is an incredible story. This is an incredible story. And, and, and I bet today the value you have and the way you are treating and embracing your life uh, should you know, uh, like should mirror a little bit how hard was all those, all those moments and all the story you have to, uh, to go through. So let's start with the, the beginning. At five years old, you had to, uh, yeah. to, to go through the, the loss of your parents who were an incredible uh, fire uh, um, in your house. Uh, you don't remember that, yeah. you don't remember that much, but those stuff stuck with you. And especially when I bet you, grow up a little bit older so what is yes today that your parents um, you have, how many kids you have uh, now i have three okay okay so does that i have does a, that i have affect a board, you a lot uh, it affects me a lot as i got older i feel like you said so I'll, i'll tell you my full story when i was five um i had a there was a house fire and i lost both my mom and my dad Um, we all, me and my brothers got separated. Three, three of my brothers went to live with one aunt. One brother went to live with another one of my mother's sisters. And I went to live with another aunt, my other mother's sister. Um, I think, like you said, as you're, as you're at a certain age, you don't really understand what's going on. You don't know where you are in life. You, you're really struggling to just find. And I think as I got older, 12, 13, 14, like the age of my kids, they're now, it came to a point where it was like, you know, you're questioning why, why me, why, why, what did I do to deserve this? And I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of lonely nights and there was a lot of dark, dark nights. Um, I found basketball at a very young age and let's say 10 years old. And the thing with basketball, I was kind of athletic at a lot of sports, so I could play a lot of different things. But when I played basketball, I was, I was passionate about it. And it kind of took me out of the life I was living. So if that makes any sense, it kind of, it kind of was like my outlet. It was an outlet for me to, to deal with the loss of my parents, to deal with being separated from my brothers, to deal with anything I was dealing with in life. And I just fell in love with the game. I fell in love with that place that it took me. Um, the passion grew. The work was always there. I was always a hard worker, but I feel I continued to work and had these crazy dreams because When I was playing basketball, I felt free. I felt like there was no demons, you know, there was no struggle, there was no nothing and everything came to me. And then I just like, I had these crazy dreams. I'd watch the guy on your back wall there, Michael Jordan playing. And yeah. I just like dreaming of, of being and playing in the NBA and, and, and no one really believed in me to, to, to at an early age. And then there was always doubters along the way. So I just, I, I built my homemade hoop. So I'm from a really small town. I think a lot of people don't understand as well. I'm from a town with like 50 people. <laughs> yeah. So we have no corner store. We have no stoplights. You know, we, I went to a school from grade kindergarten to 12 was 200 kids, you know, <laughs> so you're looking at less than 20 per classroom. Wow. So, um, can you describe maybe, the first hoop? Can you tell me? Oh, my first hoop, I'll tell you about my hoop. So, Uh, my first hoop was a bucket. I cut the bottom out of a bucket. Then we went on to a bicycle rim. So we beat all the spokes out of a bicycle rim. And then we end up making a homemade hoop. So I got two big sticks cut and got cut. And 
my uh, my high school coach gave me an old rim in the, from the gym, and we put that on some plywood and I put it right on the highway. So I'd hear the cars coming and I'd get off the road and then eventually people start waving at me, saying hi, and everybody kind of knew to slow down because I was always playing. I'd literally play, I'd play right after school till dark on Saturdays and Sundays or in the summertime, I'd play eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Easy, easy. I, I just loved, I loved the place that it took me. I loved the place where I felt free and happy. And then I became better and, and good, but I was always a scrawny little kid but I had this, I always had this swag around the court. Like I was always confident in, in myself because it was almost like it was my alter ego. Like off the court, I'm really quiet and timid and shy. And then you get me on the court and I'm like a whole different animal. So um, we we'll talk, like, we'll talk about some of your best trash talk. That, that yeah, I like to. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some <laughs> European stories. The, uh, so then I, I end up leaving. I end up leaving when I was uh, 16, 17 to go to Ontario to try to get recruited. So I selected a school, St. Thomas Aquinas. I selected this school because there was uh, the provincial team, Newfoundland team, sent out a pamphlet in the mail and they were just promoting like, you know, academics and stuff. And There was a kid under that got a scholarship from St. Thomas Aquinas. So I was like, I, I want to go to that school. So I, I fished that summer and raised up money. And I went up to Ontario and lived with my cousin, who was like a brother to me. And I went to St. Thomas Aquinas. But that teachers, the teachers went on strike. So I never got to, I never got to play. I never got to play ball. So it was, uh, it was challenging, not needless to say. But then I got on a circuit, the AUA circuit, with, with just a friend of a friend of a teacher. And my first, uh, my first one of my incidents, I don't know if you remember reading it, but I went down to Jana Finch. So Jana Finch is one of the toughest neighborhoods in Canada. Yeah, yeah. I'm down there and it's the first time everybody's meeting me and even my teammates. So I'm seven, in the Seven eight foot guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, okay, yeah. let's go, let's go, let's talk about that. <laughs> so I'm down, I'm down in Jana Finch and first thing which blew me away was I, we had to go in through the metal detectors. I'm like, metal detectors we're in we're going into a school here so then i'm in the layup lines and my own teammates are talking talking trash to me my teammates and i'm like i'm on your team like what's what's going on here and they're like can you hang ghosts what are you doing down here ghosts and they're all calling me the white ghost so i'd say three four minutes in the game and i have i have this move where i kind of rock and shake and go so i faked it and to the baseline went to the middle And when I took off, I dunked on the biggest guy in the gym. Like, I mean, crammed on him. And the whole place went up. My teammates came over hugging me. The people on the stage started throwing chairs. I got scared, ran under a table. Like, I was like, where the hell am I right now? And basically shut the game down. So after that, I've been, I've been accepted pretty much anywhere in Canada. Um, but we went on then. I went on to uh, try to get recruited. I was playing on this AUA circuit. But... By the time I started playing towards the end of the year, so we missed the whole basketball season with, with my high school. Yeah. Um, and I was just getting these games. But a lot of teams like Syracuse were helping me put me in a prep school. And because no, not a lot of teams had scholarships because this was March, April, May, June, towards the end of the year. So we went down to we went down to a place in New Jersey, Atlantic Cape Camps. So I wasn't recognized enough to go to Nike Five Star or Adidas ABC, ABCD. So um, I was tearing up the Atlantic Cape camps and I was MVP and the people came over to recruit me from Nike and Adidas. The word got out, like, you got to go see this kid. Mm -hmm. And after that, after that tournament there, or that camp, I got about 30, 40 scholarship offers. So my whole goal was to go to this prep school in Pennsylvania and they were late with the paperwork. So I was committed, but they, the paperwork wasn't showing. So then Hawaii and a few more schools were recruiting me and I, I could take a couple of visits. So I was like, when Hawaii came on the picture, I was like, oh, let's go to Hawaii. I mean, I'm, I'm, you got to understand, like, I, I don't come from much. So. You're a Newfoundlander. So, uh, yeah. and, and uh, coming from a small village like this. So Hawaii is like paradise, paradise. Paradise, man. I was like, let me go out here and see, like, I'll never get a chance to go to a place like this. I was like, I'm just going to go around and visit. But I went there on a visit and fell in love with it and the coaching staff and everything. And then I signed when I was there. So um, that's kind of my journey just to get out of Newfoundland and get now. Obviously, it's a little bit rockier and a lot more things happen in between. But that's kind of like the synopsis. Yeah, that's a uh, wow. You got out like and, and this when this went like in. It took, it took you like uh, 
you started to play more and more. Uh, you yeah. went in Toronto in 2009. Which year are yeah. you going to Toronto? 2008, 2009. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. yeah, that's a nice that's a nice word. So let's so let's move out after that to the this season draft. So in the yeah. new book, and I love that part. I love yeah. that part because you know if you don't if you don't know guys basketball there is a professional professional but professional sport in the, the US there is a, there is a, that thing that we call the NBA draft and yeah. that night is that night is very very special for every player especially when you are supposed to be uh, ranked in ranked in the list and you know about it because people talk to you people call you you are in the, you are you have good reputation because you play with different team and different uh, scrimmage I guess And and they watch they watch you play with your team. They watch you played in practices, right? Yeah. So, so basically, the way so we went through a bunch of different process. So I graduated early as a junior at the University of Hawaii, and I kind of had my mind made up that I was going to enter the draft. So I ended up entering the draft, and I was projected anywhere from the highest I was was 21, and the lowest I was was like 38 to 40. So I was like, I'll take my chances. Um, things didn't go as planned. Like you said, this was the strongest draft in NBA history from LeBron James to Carmelo Anthony to the Dwayne Wade to Chris Bosh to Kurt Heinrich. The list goes on. So um, it was one of those things. If I had to have the right agent, they would have said, go back to school. You're in Hawaii. Go back for your senior year. So there's all these things that could have factored in to, to me making the decision. So I end up entering the draft and – It ended up turning in, like you said, should be the best night. It was one of the worst nights of my life. So I'm in uh, the agents I had rented the Indian, Indian Motorcycle Club downtown and all my friends and family flew up from Newfoundland. But you have to picture that at this time, I'm one of the biggest athletes in Canada alongside yeah. Steve yeah, 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 yeah. And these people. So was not only was it, it was a financial opportunity, like there was three, four million dollars worth of sponsorship on yeah. the table. So from Wheaties to General Motors to Air Canada, because, you know, I'm a, you know, I was, I, I had a high profile coming out of college and everybody saw my story. And, and your story is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah of my course. story was crazy. So it was very marketable to a lot of different companies. Mm -hmm. You know, let's take this kid. He came from nothing or blah, blah, blah. So there was, there was a lot of opportunities. Um, I ended up going undrafted. So the whole night on every camp, I'm sitting on the couch with my wife at, or my girlfriend at the time was my wife now. But every, uh, every camera there was about 50 cameras. Every time the, draft, the guy come on, all the cameras are shining on me and the bright lights and I'm sweating. And the teams are calling my phone and I'm like, okay, I'll go anywhere. I'm happy to, they're like, no, Carl, you don't understand. We have no draft picks left. Uh, we just want you to come to Summer League. And I'm like, call my agent. They're like, we tried, but his phone is off. Mm. So my agent's phone was dead. My brothers were upset. I was holding back tears. Like it was, it was the toughest pill to swallow um, probably ever since in my whole professional career. So then to top it all off, we leave the, we leave the party and I'm going to my hotel room. And I guess I was sweating so much during the two, three hours of the event that as I stepped my foot up to get into the, to get into the car or the taxi, my pants ripped from, from my crotch <laughs> right up to my back. And I'm just like, I just look up. I'm like, oh my. why is this happening to me today of all days? So um, I tell you what, if you're an athlete out there and for anybody listening, I feel I've learned more from, from failures, from losses, from downfall than I've ever learned from winning and succeeding. I think when, when, you, hit, when you hit where I hit, and that's the ultimate low as a professional athlete, when you have all this money and all these things on the table and, and it doesn't go as planned, you really got to do some soul surfing to, to find out who you really are as a person. And I dug deep and, and I came back stronger. I came back to the point where I was like, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. And three weeks later, I, I signed a two year contract with the Indiana Pacers. Um, it wasn't fully guaranteed, but it was the most money I've ever seen in my life at that time. So um, I continued to fight. I continued to work. And I ended up in the, in the D-League. Uh, it was all a numbers game. Like, the NBA was totally different back then than what it is now. Like, the D-League only had six teams, where now they have 28. Yeah. There's, you know, the... the teams, two. 
and 13. Now they keep 17, 19. So it's, it's totally changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you, I mean, you decide to go to the D League. Yeah. And you have that opportunity. But before that, I want to talk about having the opportunity to play around with a great Larry Bird, yeah. with a great yeah. Reggie Miller with a great Chuck person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about those practices and scrimmage with Ron Artest in front Ooh. of you. That was, that was, I mean, a part that only, I mean, of, of course, those, those stuff outside, uh, happen outside of the your camera, the camera, you know, but only the guy inside knows. Ron Artest, Ron Artest, yeah. If Ron Artest hears his stories, he's going to know about this. That's for sure. He's so, gonna know. Yeah. He's gonna, <laughs> Ron, uh, Ron was one of those guys that just, just loved the practice. And so intense all the time. And quite frankly, the reason I got that contract was Ron was in town. And like, you got to understand. So here's an NBA guy, probably at that time, 40, $50 million contract. And we're a bunch of like, like uh, rookies and, and, and scrubs that are just out trying to get a look to come to camp but he wanted to practice with us. So he came out and he practiced and I was playing really well, but they put Ron Artest on me. And this guy was the strongest guy I've ever seen. And, you know, not alone say played against. So he was, he was punking me and, you know, I'd get up and, and hit another shot and he'd throw me to the ground again. And like, he was coming at me, but I wasn't backing down. And Donnie Walsh at the time who was the president. He came to me after he's like, I want to sign you. And I said, Donnie, man, I was like, I felt you should have drafted me. And then he told me why he didn't draft me. Something was after happened to his kid and he wasn't there. And he's like, I liked you for a while. And anyway, he said, we really liked how you handled Ron. Like Ron is a defensive specialist and you did your thing. So like, I was like, all right, well, you send me the contract. And sure enough, Monday morning he did. But even then when we started training, like you're with the Reggie Millers and like I'd be shooting after practice, we'd always shoot me, Reggie, Fred Jones, Jamie, James Jones. Um, you know, some great shooters, but then over on the side was Chuck Persons, Larry Bird, Rick Carlisle, and they're watching, and, and Reggie, we'd be going through all these shots that Reggie hits in a game, and you're like, this is why he hits them, so we're going through these routines, he's like, in order for us to make these in a the game, we got to do these now, so I'm just gasping at the moment, and I'm like, I'm getting instruction from Reggie Miller, I'm on side of Kamora NBA players, but like, I'm looking over, and there's Larry Bird, and Chuck Persons, and some of the best shooters to ever play the game, I'm like, you know, I, I was truly blessed, So it, it was, it was some amazing things, but then uh, Reggie was probably 38, 39, countless millions of dollars, but like he hit a three in practice. He's like, I love this. I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I like the passion that they had and, and the tips and things that they give you is uh, it, it's pretty, it was pretty special time. I mean, um, then I went on to the, to the D league. The D league was, was a roller coaster. Uh, and I get, I think if I had to stay there, I, I eventually would have got my shot. Mm -hmm. But what really hurt me was towards the end of my second year, I was with uh, the late Dennis Johnson who played with the yeah. Celtics. Mm -hmm. um, I got a call from, from Orlando and they were checking how I was, how I was healthy. They were about to sign me for the last six, eight weeks, two months of the season. So, you know, this would have been a financial bump up as well. I mean, in a time like that, you can make, you know, 80, 90 grand American in, in a month, you know, two months, you know, so it was, It was pretty crazy. So then I go to the airport and I'm waiting and my agent was meeting me in Orlando to sign a contract. And sure enough, I get a call as I'm sitting there and a big guy went down in practice and they're like, we can't bring you in right now. We're going to continue to follow. So I was devastated. And I called my agent. I was like, listen, man, I was like, I'm done with this roller coaster because he was like, there's some great opportunities overseas for a shooter like you. So then, then we decided to go overseas. So Overseas was was different. I mean, first year was in Italy. You don't know the language. You don't know the food. <clears throat> You're trying to find yourself as a person. You're trying to find where to fit in. You know, I think the first the first month I drove on the wrong lane and I got fined 8,000 euros for driving in the bus lane to practice every day. And I'm just like, just like little things. So uh, people uh, have to remember again. I mean, it's uh, I mean from from where you were living yes. to to eat to Europe, this yeah. totally different culture to you. So, so you must have learned so much, so much toward that journey. That's for yeah, sure. For sure. But like, it was all sort of little things like internet is not like me and you're doing right now. There was no FaceTime. There was no iPhone. You know, there's no way to 
to communicate with your loved ones. So for me, it was a, it was a full on struggle and I had to just adjust to everything. But from there we went, I uh, had a decent year, not as good as, not as good as expected. Um, but my next year I went to Croatia and I was very nervous going to Croatia because I didn't, I didn't know anything about it and I didn't know nothing, but I ended up playing, um, for a couple of great coaches, one of them being Aso Petrovic, who dragged on Petrovic's brother. Yeah. I played in his stadium where it all started for drag. So their culture was, I was like, this is the Mecca, you know, and I went in there and I'm, I'm tearing up that league. So the way Eastern Europe with especially Croatia and Serbia and all these uh, Baltic regions, they have a very strong influence in the basketball community and their, oh, yeah. coach, their coaches are sprinkled all mm-hmm. around the best leagues in the world. So me not knowing this, I went in there and I was MVP of the league, leading scorer. And then we played in the Adriatic League, which is against all these European uh, EuroLeague teams from all over. Yeah. And I was top leading scorer in that. So my, my career kind of skyrocketed from there. And then I went to, I went to Spain. Uh, I, I was two years in Gran Canaria. Then I went to Victoria, Spain, which was probably the best team I ever played on. We had six. Victoria is a great team in Europe, like in Spain with Madrid and Barcelona, one of the greatest. Teams. Yeah, we were, and that year we won the we won the ACB championship. Whoa. We we lost in the we lost to Cheska to go to the final four for Euroleague, and you know I was the third, fourth leading scorer on that team of guys making two plus million euros a season. So that team that we had there probably would have been beaten the bottom 10 teams in the NBA easy. So it, it was a stud, it was a stud team. And then from there, I went to a uh, Juventud where Ricky Rubio and Rudy Fernandez came from. And I went to Sevilla, um, some, some great history played there with uh, Christoph Pozingas. Yeah. Um, and Seth Zakaransky that plays in Chicago now. Mm-hmm. And then went, went all over, but I, I took my time from there went back to Tenerife. I ended up going to Puerto Rico in between injuries. I went to um, Athens, Greece, which was amazing. Then I went back to Tenerife and I went back, I went to Alba Berlin then, which is another historic club in Europe. And then I finished my last two years off in, in St. John's. But let me tell you one story about um, Athens. So <laughs> we were in the middle of Athens or we're at it. We're at a, the way Greece works is you can't, you can't travel. You're, you can only go to home games. Like our fans can't travel on the road. <clears throat> so we're in this stadium, I'd say eight, 10,000 people in there. And before we go in there, like I always, I'm pretty on the court. I'm a, I'm a very uh, cocky and arrogant. <laughs> say like, I want to you back it up. Day. You back it up. So as long as you yeah. back it up, it's good. <laughs> yeah. So I like to back it up. Like I don't really get going, but if someone gets at me, I really get after it. So anyway, um, my security with Greece used to come to me everywhere. They're like, English, no talk today. No talk, no talk. And I'm like, okay. And then they knew what it was going to be. So we're in this, we're in this stadium and I, I start lighting it up and I start shushing the crowd and, you know, throwing up the signs for threes. And, and all of a sudden they just go nuts at me every time I catch the ball. And I, I'm coming down this one time and I, I see this thing coming out of the side of my eye and I, I dodge it. Anyway, it was a, a water bottle, but it was after being filled up with pee. Someone was after peeing in the bottle and throwing it at me. So all the security come out and they cover me and everything. And they take me in the back and we're like, English, we told you no talk today. Very dangerous, very dangerous. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, uh, I really flourished in these, these type of moments and, and loved. I love that type of atmosphere. I love to be the, the, not so much the villain, but the underdog and, and go into people's arenas and light them up. And it was all part of my journey. It was all part of the full, the full story. I, I, feel, I feel there's been so much, a lot of times my story, there's been so much rise up from, from my past and rise up from my, you know, the loss of my parents and things that, you know, it gets overshadowed at times. And then like, we can talk about the Canada stuff. I mean, 10, 12 years, you know, with, with my national team and a focal point to that and helping, helping build to where it's at now but it's been uh it's been a hell of a journey man i must say <laughs> it looks like it man yeah. looks like it you yeah. you enjoyed it and um, you know you know what's amazing amazing me the most and i talked about that with a few guy who play, well, that i had in my show in basketball we underestimate a lot the level of basketball in europe europe yeah. is not uh is not 
very bad in basketball, not at all. There is a good professional player. The league is exceptional. The atmosphere are crazy. You know, I'm coming from Europe. I was born in Africa. Yeah. And I lived in France for a while. And, and I follow basketball. And I was a fan of, uh, and I'm still a fan of uh, a soccer fan going to the stadium and cheer and stuff. And that's different mentality than here. Yes. And that's what people don't, don't understand. Here, when you go to a, to a basketball game or hockey game, it's a family uh, uh, moment. You have yes. a hot dog, uh, you eat, uh, you eat, uh, you drink your beer, and uh, not like that in Europe. We, we answer to we answer to the screen and everything. We don't do that in Europe. In Europe, they get ready for you. They have cheer and chant. They they, they even have coins somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah, very, yeah. very 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 like they used to heat the coins and then throw the hot coins at. So this is this is not like people don't know those those story and playing those atmosphere flares, like throwing flares like we have played in places like. When I come home here and play in North America, it's like it's it's boring. Like over there, it's like intense, and it's like soccer fans are singing and dancing, and like I'd have friends and family come over, and they're like, "This wow. atmosphere is unbelievable." <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like they're working hard. The fans are working just as hard as the players at times. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know? And it's uh, it's intense, man. It, I love it. I, I actually, I absolutely love it. Uh, that's uh, that's something unique that you have the chance to uh, to live uh, to live though let's talk about let's talk about um, basketball and actually basketball today we are in the middle of the playoff yes um lebron might might win his fourth ring his that's first. a debate that i always have with my swimmer owen you know with a great lebron fan and i don't take anything back from LeBron. LeBron is, yeah. is a monster. I mean, he is, he is your age, uh, a little yeah. bit younger than you and still destroying destroying the NBA. But I mean, this guy over there, I mean, yeah. uh, no, no. To me, like the, the young fellas have to, have to, unfortunately, they didn't, they were not there to, to be with us when we are enjoying Michael Jordan. But, wow, I think there is a difference. But what's your take on LeBron James? Um, I tell you what I like about LeBron. Um, I like the fact that everything he does off the court is pretty, pretty, pretty substantial, pretty substantial and pretty, pretty special. The things, how he helps kids and the things he's done, the things I dislike is the fact, um, the way he exposed Cleveland when he went to, when he went to Miami and then got his first ring that way. Um, I would have much more respect for him if he had to stay in Cleveland. Even if people come in there and people, he, people come in to play with him, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty special. I think MJ, there's a couple of things that separate the two. MJ always wanted the last shot. He always wanted to win or lose with him. Um, I think a lot of people have a different perspective for MJ after the last dance. I think they understood more that, you know, true fans really get. Um, the fact that he never lost in an NBA finals shows you he was refused to lose, you know, his effort to lose. Um, but again, LeBron to me, it just changed, just changed the game being a physical specimen, you know, playing one through five. Um, he, it's hard to take things away from him, but again, MJ, MJ is my, is my one. And then I have to go with Kobe as my two, because I had to obviously had the unique chance of playing against this man. And that's my next, my next topic, to my next topic right there. I mean, I mean, in that discussion and that make me sick guys, because I yeah. love basketball so much, but everyone forgets about Kobe. Everyone forgets about Kobe. What? Like, like, like the guy is five rings play is like, for every game, I mean, the reason, I mean, everyone has a Kobe story. Everyone knows Kobe. Yeah. He, I think that people give it give it the credit much more at the end of his career than at the beginning, because yes. he was giving back more a little bit. He was sharing more a little bit about his life and yeah. he was getting older. Yeah. But the problem with Kobe is people saw that. Like me, I was into it. He was. I was like. Totally the same, the same person, the same situation as well. I was looking at Kobe like it's Michael Jordan. Yeah, Michael Jordan. But so what? Everyone like you, I, I see that in your book. You modelize, you watch people, you copy, move. You want to, you want to, you're gonna yeah. get better away watching those stuff. And this guy took everything he could from from uh, from uh, Michael Jordan. So 
Yeah, well, you're taking, you're taking uh, from the best. So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I can't fault him. For that. You know, I can't fault Kobe for doing that. Like at the end of the day, as a player, you take different things and you try to combine everything that you that they're doing. Like I had the chance to work with Ray, Ray Allen and Reggie, and all these things are are stuff that you you try to take little pieces of what they've done. So, um. I didn't realize the relationship that Kobe and Jordan had after he spoke at his thing. And, yeah. and you, you don't realize these things, like you said, the stories that I can tell about being with the Pacers, you don't realize where, you know, where their relationships lie, mm-hmm. but um, you can't forget Kobe. I played Kobe two times. The first time I was starstruck because there was Kobe, LeBron, KD, Dwight Howard, anybody, you name it. It was, it was crazy. Um, the second time I came out with that swagger and right from the jump, I was like, every, every point I score today, I need a pair of Kobe shoes. He's like, all right, young fella. Anyway, and, and <laughs> we're the same age or, and if not, I'm older. And, and then when it was kind of like, he was quiet, you know, but then I had him on the right side and I crossed him and I brought it back and the crowd kind of woke him up. They're like, Oh, you know, and, and then it was something like something snapped and he came down and scored eight straight points. He stole – next play down, he stole the ball from me at half court, dunked it. Next play down, um, I trap him over in the corner. He takes a fade away when I stop him, and I, like, I literally land it, and then he shot it. He was still in the air. He hung that long. And then we trapped him at half court, and he stepped through the trap and didn't pass it, shot it, and banked it in. And I was like, oh, shit. We got him woke up the Mamba, right? So it was, it was pretty special, but it was uh, – Obviously, looking back on how the chain of events and everything happened, you you cherish these moments. And, you know, I ha- I was on the floor with the best players that will go down in the history of the game. So it, it's, it's pretty special. What game, what game was that? It was Canada versus uh, the the Redeem team in New Jer- in uh, Las Vegas. We played them two, two years in a row. One was a warm-up, and then the next year was in uh, qualifying for the Olympics or something. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty special. Game. Good, good memories. I read another one. Like uh, so, so uh, let me f- let let's finish on that topic because yeah. that's a good topic. Go MJ, Kobe, with your third one. I mean, based on what's going on, you have to go with. I would go with LeBron. I think, especially if they win it now. Um, a lot of the older greats. Uh, I'm a huge Steve Nash fan of everything that he's ever done. Um, for me, it's hard to credit where these guys come and the ability that he came and the things he did, the magic he done with, you got to look at the body, like look at what Ron was given. And then he put in the hard work and dedication. Look at what Steve was given. And now look at the hard work and dedication. And that's that different come. story. Yeah. So it's different. Any real person that understands sports and genetics and athletes, you'll understand some stuff is God given. And when you combine that God given with some really hard work, you, you create magic, you know what I mean? But then there's also these ones that you're like, how the hell did that guy get to where he is? And he, all he does is just, he's working 10 times harder than anybody else. So you can't take him out. You can't take out magic. I mean, you sh- like there's so many guys, but those, those, those ones are up there with my tops for sure. Hard work beat talent for sure. Hard work Hard always work beat talent. When talent when talent refuses to work for sure. <laughs> yeah. For so sure. more NBA, more NBA. I'm a great, great. I was a great fan. I'm still a great fan of this person. I'm a great fan yeah. of the organization. I love the European way of style, the mentality of the guy. Because people don't yeah. understand. Yeah. They don't pick just player. They pick mentality, guys. I mean, yeah. Winner, like winner mentality. People who don't fear to take the last shot right. to make the right pass. Yeah. 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 Yeah, not like you, you don't you don't even know them, but don't worry, they pick them, they pick them for the right reason. Yeah, for sure. And there is more and more team doing like they do. But from that team, uh, Team Duncan, then I yeah. love a lot, and I think this guy is uh, under uh, underestimated a lot because well, he should he, be up there. He should he, be up there as well. He should be because he has his he has his ring and is uh, one of the greatest. And and today I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at Luka Doncic. And Again, played against Luca when he was 17. So you play against him against, uh, when he was 17. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about that moment and what you Luca, think. Luca, Luca is another special town. Luca is like the European version of, you know, the LeBrons or these guys. The thing with him was a lot of people don't know. He came to Madrid early age, like 13, 14. So you got to imagine leaving home. And the way Europe works, like even Christoph Przingis, he came... So they get these kids and they invest seven years. So they're 
Seven down. I lost you. I lost you. I just lost you. I just lost you. When you say they get these okay. kids, they get these they kids get when they get seven years. They get these kids when they're young. So 13 or 13 years old, 12 years old. Yeah. And they'll give them like 5,000, 10,000, 19,000, 30, 50. And they like, they just, they, they invest in the kid and then they either sell the kid or he goes to the NBA and they get the money for his rights. So it's a huge business over there. And Luca, Luca left home. So imagine when you're 12, 13 and your parents ship you off to another country and you know, you're going to a basketball Institute or something like that. So it's a huge commitment. So you can't, don't question the way Europeans do. They're doing a great job on developing players and the talent wise, the where they lack versus the Americans, the Americans are just so physically gifted with the strength and the power and the genetic makeup. But the Europeans are more skilled and talent. You know what I mean? The fundamentals, the way they read the game. And yeah. people question if Luca was going to make the jump. And I played him when I was 17. And I was like, I'm not easily impressed because I've played against some of the greats. But I was like, yeah, this kid, this kid's got it. You know what I mean? Because two things, that Real Madrid team, again, was full up with guys that could have played in the NBA, guys that came back from playing yeah. in the NBA. Yeah, people forget and that. They could have went over and played against NBA teams and won. Mm -hmm. So not only was he playing, he was the man. Yeah. So he's taking the last shot. He's making the big plays. So everyone was like talking about, oh, look at Luca and playoffs. Luca's been doing that for two, three years. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more pressure in Europe than there is in the yeah. NBA. As we talked about, yeah. You know what I mean? Like every game in the NBA or every game in Europe matters. The NBA don't really get good until the playoffs start. Yeah. You know, but every game, like I got my first year in Spain, we were, we were up 14 points. So typically in, typically in America, you come down, you dribble the ball out. So I dribbled, I'm dribbling the ball out and I had, I had a big game, 28, 30 points. Coach is losing his mind. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? I get in the locker room. He finds me $10,000 because I didn't try to score that last point. So he's, he's looking at me and saying, you don't understand stupid American. You don't understand every point matters in Europe. This is not garbage NBA. And sure enough, believe it or not, at the end of the season, we were in a tie for eight place. So there was four teams tied. So when the teams are tied, they go for and against, and then they go points. Okay. And we, we were we finished ninth in the playoffs because of by this. like 30 something points. So he brought me in the office and he made this big old spiel. This is why we take every point in this is why we take every point in Europe. So even though you're up by 20, you're trying to be up by 22. Nobody's dribbling out the clock over there. Every point matters. Mm -hmm. Every point, you know what I mean? So I, I learned that lesson the hard way, but I, it stuck with me for a long time. So that's That's the kind of environment where the, where this kind of this kind of player like Luca don't don't kids were raised and you are not surprised to see him dominate like this now right now. Not me, I'm not at all. As, I'm not a well. Uh, I I was I was knew he was ready for this moment. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to hold you on too much because you know we I, I could like as I used to say we we can talk. I could talk for I could talk yeah, forever. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm go, I'm going through through the end. I have a few questions, a few classic questions that I have, yeah. like. When you are looking back to your to your story, your professional basketball player and the man that you have become become now, like uh, if you had like one moment where you had to stop, and because that's the way I ce I celebrate, so I'm sharing that with you guys. When okay. something when I achieve something good, which is not happening <laughs> every day, yeah. you know, depending of, of what we are targeting, right? But but it's always good to say, to tell yourself, oh, I deserve that one. I deserve it. Yeah. So what was your I deserve it moment? My, I have a couple. Um, my, I think my most proudest treasure and things I've accomplished will be my three kids. I have a beautiful family. Um, the joy that they bring me every day and the challenges that they bring me. Um, I just feel blessed to be a father to three amazing children. Um, that would be my first, I would think. Um, my second, I've accomplished a lot of things in life in a sense through, through basketball and 
and you know, it's been it's been, been a hell of a ride. Like I said, I think one of the most important things or moves that I made is when I came back home to my province here, and we're playing in the NBL of Canada, which maybe average attendance is four or five hundred people, like four or five hundred people. But I sold out that place for multiple years, and the amount of people that I touched in our community and gave me a platform to really give back and get people to show. And it was more so a thank you to me, for me, to them, for the support they gave me when I was just a little kid and I lost my parents and I was just a little kid trying to find my way. And I was a little kid that had huge dreams of making it on the big stage. And then when they came out and support me like that, it just really pulls a special place in my heart. That's beautiful that you didn't forget that because I wanted to talk about this like... Uh... In your book, it's very touching how everyone is putting the yeah. money in to, to help you out to travel, help you out to play your yeah. game. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, it brought, you almost brought me to tears when, when I yeah. look at it. I, mean, I, it was, I was very touched and say, wow, and that's the kind of, uh, you know, a small play. People don't know new new fund or new fee, whatever you want, whatever you, you, want, whatever you, whatever you call them. But, but uh, uh, I've been lucky enough to discover uh, people from that province. Yeah. They are uh, usually, usually huge guys with lots of <laughs> monster people in from that yeah. province. Pretty nice guy and huge, like well built, good yeah. drinker too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, wow, they are very honest, very pure people. Um, yes. Very given. They, they, they love to share. They love to help. And uh, and you, the way the way you describe that in your book, I mean, yeah. it's very touching. And hearing you giving back. This is, uh, this is beautiful. And hearing you talking about your kids as well, and we start about that at the beginning a little bit, but I'm sure that today, like, how does that feel today, like knowing that you can give that and going through like what you have been through with your family and the lack of having your mom and dad as a young age and having kids now? What's yeah. your reflection on that as a dad? Well, every time I look at them, that I think it really, like you kind of try to, pardon the pun, but you bury these things inside as much as you can. And I, I felt when my kids hit, when my kids hit certain ages, when my kids hit like five and then the next hit kids five. And then like right now, my kids are at the age of my oldest brother, my second oldest brother, and then myself. And I look at it and I'm like, what would they, what would they do without me? What would they do without their mom? You know? So Whatever else is going on, I'm, I'm a very strict, obviously, person with my, with my kids, and I have high goals, and I you know, want them the best to achieve. But the one thing I never take for granted is how much they know I love them and how much they know that I'm here because once that, those type of things happen to me in my life, you, put, you tend to put things in perspective, and you, you do not take things for granted anymore because tomorrow is not given, guys. So that's why I work so hard. That's why I try to accomplish everything I can. And I don't leave things for tomorrow because tomorrow's not a given day. So I guess when you have been through all those, all those, all those things that you have been through, taking the last shot or feeling the pressure for you wasn't a problem at all. No problem. No problem. It's, it's even a blessing, a blessing moment. Okay. Give it, give it to me. I'm ready, guys. I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for this all my life. So last question, last question of the show. If you had to you know, sort of just young athletes, Newfoundland athletes, Canadian, yeah. whatever, young young people, young athletes around the world who wants to yeah. succeed in professional sport, what would you, what would be the best advice you give them? The best advice I would give them is, A, is, is set your dreams, set your goals high and do whatever humanly possible to achieve those. I always tell kids and, and other athletes, They're your dreams. Don't let your parents, don't let your coaches set so set these high as possible. Um, and then believe. You got to believe in yourself and believe in your ability. Um, I think that confidence instills hard work. And I think that confidence and believe in yourself will get you through the dark moments when you get cut or when you fail or when you lose. You still have that belief in yourself that, okay, if I work a little bit harder, I'm there. So I think they're the most two key important things because – a coach is not going to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. Like you can, you can't fake that. You can't fake it. If you're on the bench and, and you're there and you're afraid to come in the game, well, the coach sees that. If you're nervous, you know, there's certain things there. So just have that self-confidence and that belief that, you know, you're special and you're a great person. And if you 
putting the time and the energy, great things will happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Carl, uh, for sharing all this all this uh, story with us. Uh, uh, I'm feel I feel very 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 lucky. I hope I will uh, do a good uh, footage out of it. Uh, no, no, awesome. <laughs> thank you, thank you very thank much. You so much for having me. It was uh, it was a real pleasure chatting it up with you. Thanks, thanks, Carl. This was all the talk. My last episode. Once again, keep subscribing, keep come and, and support support us and share some of our great greatest episodes. This was Carl English today, one of the best basketball player in Newfoundland, in Newfoundland for a long time. That's for sure. Guys, you gotta keep it up. Good luck with that. Carl, thanks. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it was all the talk. Thanks, guys. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Yeah.